I've been buying records for a long time and um, never really dug for 45s because I don't have the patience. I don't like that they're too, too small and I just don't have the patience. And uh, I'm at a record show. I see this box of records, so I run over there. This guy beats me to it and he's taking his t sweet time going through everything. So I'm sitting there waiting. While I'm waiting, there's a shoebox full of 45s next to it. So I start fingering through them, like whatever. I see one that says Bold Soul Brother on the label. So I'm like, it caught my eye. I'm like, let me check that out. Put it on my portable player and I heard the drums and I went crazy. <laughs> so far away from everything, so far from San Francisco or any other city. It seems like we're in, in a little province up here, you know? I still feel like we kind of live on the edge of the earth up here. Even, even though, you know, we're so much more connected than we ever were, I still get the sense from everybody who lives here that while we're not creating in a vacuum, there's a perceived vacuum that we're all working in here. I think that there's always been an innovation quotient to the Seattle and Pacific Northwest Sound powerful and everybody says what's in the water up there to me i mean not only music you know but i went to school high school with, with, with the same high school had bruce lee and jimmy hendrix and all those people it is something about the water or the atmosphere it's got a feeling it's the environment when you're so close to mother nature you got the sound on one end on the west end on the east end you got the lake Got all these mountains, got seasonal changes. You know, anytime Mother Nature wants to rear her head up, man, look. <laughs> Pow! Think about your culture and your surroundings. If you live in sunny wherever, you might be out playing volleyball or something. Just be in Seattle. Well, it gives you a slight advantage because it rains a lot here, so you're going to be inside practicing instead of like LA. You'll be on the beach. You won't be pressed. If it wasn't for those rainy days, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here because I practiced in the house. What are you going to do? Can you go out and play in the rain? Yeah, you can do. We did lots of stuff in the rain. But cozy inside playing the saxophone, there's a feeling. And I did that for years, and I got good. Had it been sunny outside every day, I probably would have been more into sports. Before grunge would officially brand Seattle a music town, people in the know were already well aware of Seattle's rich musical history. From the 1930s to the 50s, Seattle had a thriving jazz scene producing musical luminaries like Quincy Jones, Ray Charles, and Ernestine Anderson. Seattle, when I was a kid, people in America that were not aware of this, you know, Seattle was the hottest city in America during the World War II. I mean, on fire, baby. And all the military was here, Fort Lauderdale, Marines, Navy, everything. And it was on fire. I never really set out to collect records. You know, I was just always buying records. I have about 50,000. I have a couple uh, storage units 
that I ran. I was just buying, I always just was just buying records. And then luckily that day is when I, I just didn't remember every record I find. I don't remember where I found this one. I think I saw a lot of uh, people asking me, for, like DJs at Collins, say, hey, I need this record, Ron Buford. So uh, you know, when I found it, I did research on the label, and it was from Linwood, Washington. I was like, well, let me drive out there and see if I can find anything out. And uh, I drove up there, and it was just bushes. Like, there was nothing there. I like how things were recorded back then, kind of raw, you know. Oh, it's loud. first organ was a, um, was a Thomas organ that had a record player on the side, and um, my father got me that. My mother told me, look, if I got good grades and graduate, I could get a brand new GTO. I'd go down there every day to the Pontiac dealer and sit in it, call my mother, listen, fall out, have a tantrum. Only thing to change that was the B3 and the Leslie. Oh, the car? That was out of the pit. That was out of the question. Actually, the B3 back then cost more than the car. I met Udo Thomas. Um, he was working with the same group called the Monterey's. And uh, he decided to stay up here for a while, and he had left the Monterey's. Then I met Ronnie, and the Ronnie, was, the Ronnie at that particular time, he was supposed to be the top jazz band player, so. He wanted to record, ask me if I would come and do a vocal, with, do my song vocally with him, and so we rehearsed one time. And we were doing a gig at the 410, and we caught one of those magic grooves. We left straight from the 410 and went to the studio. And then I just put the words to it, you know, gather around me. Gather around, everybody. Let me tell you all about it. This feeling deep inside makes you want to stomp and shout. Now, <laughs> that's how that got started. The lead soul, second take. Nobody in the country was pumping out that sound, that Ron Buford, Euro Thomas sound. Told 5,000 copies in two weeks. In San Francisco, we were like number one on the blues station down there for almost a year. I mean, it was incredible. Ah! Uh -huh. 